Thank you so much, Judith. Hello, everyone. My name is Shauna Van Blixen. I'm from the Council of the Baltic Sea States. We are an intergovernmental organization, and we are also the lead partner on a project called Promise. And while the presentation loads, at least on my screen, I'll just continue. Actually, that's difficult. The first slide has a very important uh, image that you need to see. But anyway, I will say that uh, Promise is supporting the uh, growth and expansion of the Barnahus model throughout Europe and even beyond. Um, and the Barnahus model is supporting child victims and witnesses of violence to, uh, to have a child-friendly setting, a safe and professional environment to tell about um, to tell about their stories, and um, well, if I just changed the slide. Maybe you can see it. I, I still don't. Uh, if you can see the slide, there is a, an image that shows uh, a number of professional groups which are organized under one roof. And that really is the key here, that uh, in order to arrange services with a child at the center to really support the child in this time, oh good, you can see it, um, to support the child in, in this time, uh, it's, it's vital that the services all meet the child in one physical place, literally under one roof, a one-stop shop. When ch children go to uh, a Barnahus or a similar setup and have an interview, the interview is usually recorded, uh, and this recording may be used uh, as evidence in court. And of course, for some cases, it may be possible to collect physical evidence, and this is where a medical evaluation team that is uh, regularly on site and part of the routines at the Barnahus becomes vitally important. Beyond that, of course, the, a medical evaluation is so much more than just evidence gathering. It's also an important part of the healing process, both physically and mentally. We talked a little bit about that in part one of this mini-series last week, and I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about it today and also in part three in a few weeks from now. This mini-series is part of a bigger series, From Zero to Bonahus. The series is inspired by the first phase of the Promise Project, which um, explored the standards and criteria of Barnahus and similar setups. Um, it, and, oh, here we go. Yeah, now I see it. Good. Uh, so it explored the criteria for Barnahus and similar models in depth and developed standard setting publications. And key professionals from around Europe were invited to take part in this process. Now, with this webinar series, it's an open invitation to join these discussions within the European Barnahus movement about these key principles, standards, and challenges to consider. And on your screen now, you see the publications that came from the first phase of the project, and these are the inspirations for the, this, web, this whole webinar series. Uh, the hero document, uh, and one that we are referencing throughout this mini webinar series about medical evaluation, is the one in the top right there, the Barnahus Quality Standards. This one comes in a number of flavors. You've got a summary, an ebook of that summary, and the summary is also translated into many languages now. You'll find all of these and more at the Promise website, which is at the link uh, in the web links just down below. There's a bunch of web links where you can go directly there. The format for today, we have um, one featured speaker and one or two contributing speakers. So the idea is that the featured speaker will speak to until about 40 past the hour, 40 minutes past the hour, and then the contributing speakers will come to give their reflections and to participate in answering questions. Together they represent multiple countries, deep, broad uh, background experience, perspectives, and we hope that this helps you to support your work. Our featured speaker today is Resmi Oral, a professor of pediatrics, director of the Child Protection Program at the University of Iowa and in the United States. And she will have a bit more time to introduce herself as she gets started. We also have on your screen, you can see, Stefan Rune, Karolinska Hospital University. He uh, was the featured speaker in our webinar last week, part one, Framework for Medical Standards. You can already watch it now. Uh, and the link is available somewhere. Uh, and we may also have a, 
Andrea Goldard with us from the UK. Her webinar is on 19th of November. We hope you join us. It's on sexual abuse, diagnostic workup, and decision making. Today we're talking about uh, physical abuse, diagnostic workup, and decision making. And with that, I would like to invite Stefan Luna to turn off his uh, video. And as I pass the floor over to Rasnia, I will just say two things. One, we really appreciate if you are participating in the chat and asking questions. If the speaker doesn't get to your question during her, her talk, then we'll try to get to them at the end. And also, depending on your professional background, you may or may not be uh, used to seeing images uh, of these children and such. So just so you know, there are a few images like that coming up. Um, that's nothing too graphic. If you are a medical professional and you would like to see the detailed photos, uh, send me an email. I'll write my email in the in the chat here, and we'll get that to you directly. Without any further ado, Rezmiya, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning for me, and uh, good afternoon for everybody else in Europe and even. Uh, Eastern people from Pakistan. I see there's a um, attendee. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to discuss this topic with you. Um, so let me uh, move on. Oh, I will have some uh, slides of a variety of national parks in my presentation. That's how I have been able to keep up with the very difficult child abuse work all these years. Um, so last week, Stefan uh, very elegantly and uh, effectively shared with us uh, all the grayed out items on this uh, first slide. And this week, I will try to uh, walk you through the steps of diagnostic workup for specifically physical abuse and uh, for victims of physical violence recognize physical indicators of physical abuse and develop a diagnostic interpretation pathway to diagnose uh, physical abuse. Uh, I know that not everybody is a medical provider, but I believe because the work uh, at Barnehus and in affiliated institutions that we do and we will do uh, has to be multidisciplinary uh, all different disciplines uh, in the equation should have a basic understanding of what everybody else is doing uh, in the collaboration. And uh, that is why there will be a little bit of uh, medical information here, uh, but it's going to be as basic as possible too. So we are dealing with victims of physical violence in addition to other forms of violence when it comes to the clientele that will come to Barnehus and its affiliated uh, institutions. Um, okay, so uh, those uh, that may have uh, mild uh, symptoms of physical violence and who are medically stable with a few bruises or fractures and things like that may indeed be handled uh, in the Barnehus outpatient setting. But there will also be severely injured and medically unstable victims of violence. Those children cannot be handled in the Barnehus setting because uh, it is an outpatient setting and uh, these children are not going to have uh, or uh, these children will need a comprehensive uh, hospital setting and a lot of times in inpatient setting. And that is the basis of um, my point. If from this presentation you forget everything else, I hope you will remember that Every Barnehus that is not established in a hospital setting must develop an affiliation with a hospital where the severely injured uh, victims of physical violence can be treated and forensically evaluated, just like we do mostly for sexual abuse cases uh, and milder forms of physical abuse and victims of or witnesses of uh, violence are being evaluated in the Barnehus setting as you see here. So 
we know that Barnehus will work with the police, child protective services, and the prosecutor uh, in uh, a multidisciplinary interagency collaboration. But I would like to stress one more time that uh, the other link of the collaboration must involve uh, a hospital setting, which will uh, collaborate bilaterally. It's not only going to be Barnehus referring patients to the uh, hospital setting, but it will also be uh, the hospital referring patients after the initial treatment is done for forensic evaluation at the Barnehus setting. Uh, so, first I would like to understand um, how many of you are already working for a Barnehus. Okay. All right, people are discovering how to do this poll. Okay, it looks like uh, most of you are not working for a Barnehus uh, at this point. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Looking at how a hospital child protection team should be organized, uh, the core of the team should have a medical component, medical provider. It may be a pediatrician, family practice doctor, uh, forensic medicine, physician, any combination. But a medical provider supported with a nurse uh, is very important. And then the hospital should have its own social work uh, support for the child protection team. And in especially developing countries, uh, my experience showed me that psychology and child psychiatry are usually involved in this core team uh, to support the forensic evaluators. And then around the uh, circle, uh, is uh, other uh, providers, especially for physical abuse, the red highlighted ones, ophthalmology, radiology, orthopedic, pediatric surgery, neurosurgery, forensic pathology, may be more involved with the core team to provide consultative knowledge to the uh, medical providers of the uh, child protection team. Um, so, how many of you already work for a hospital with pediatric inpatient unit is another information that I'd like to understand. Okay, we're learning this poll. All right, okay. So very few of you work for a hospital. Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> so I hope those of you who don't work at a hospital setting will be able to reach out to your neighboring hospital and identify individuals who may be interested in working with you in collaboration to manage severe forms of uh, physical abuse uh, cases in the hospital working together with you. So when a hospital decides to establish a child protection team, there must be a stakeholders planning meeting. And this meeting will involve all the disciplines that I showed you in the previous uh, slide to address all of these issues in a stepwise manner. First of all, which cases will require a child protection consultation? How will the consultation system operate? How will the Barnehus and the hospital handle bilateral referrals, as I mentioned before? What kind of paperwork is going to be used during the consult to gather standard 
information on every single case. What kind of documentation devices and system uh, we're going to use, especially to document the injuries observed on the child? Uh, how is the reporting going to work? Uh, is it going to be through the Barnahus? Is it going to be directly to Child Protection Services and the police or either one of these uh, entities? That needs to be worked out in your uh, own community based on your laws. And then what's going to happen uh, during the post-consultation uh, processes? Uh, and of course, when all of this is uh, put into writing in a memorandum, then staff education will be needed uh, across the hospital, across disciplines, um, as we will discuss. So those of you uh, who work with a hospital in your community, please tell us how many of you already have a hospital-based multidisciplinary child abuse team that you work with. Okay, so it looks like only one person is associated uh, with a hospital-based uh, multidisciplinary team. In the chat box, can that person identify themselves and their country? Um, so uh, I know who that person is. Thank you. So originally, I am from Turkey. Uh, and I, you will see some slides from Turkey as well. So in terms of the hospital staff education plan, when all is uh, put into a memorandum, creating a written protocol on how to recognize, evaluate, and manage physical abuse cases is extremely important. And for those of you who would like to uh, have the written protocol that I developed for my own hospital, I'd be more than happy to share it uh, with you. Training all relevant staff on the protocol, starting with the child protection team, is of paramount importance. And then nowadays, we're living in, an, uh, in a virtual uh, time. Uh, so I'm pretty sure every hospital has a password protected website. In that website, placing this protocol and even small flyers for the staff uh, to tap into when a case hits the emergency room uh, to find out what they need to do for the next step may be extremely uh, helpful. And in my setting, uh, I provide uh, education to all relevant residency programs on an annual basis in, t in part um, as part of their annual core curriculum lectures. Every residency batch from uh, surgery to family practice to pediatrics, emergency department, etc., receive a child protection clinical guidelines uh, use lecture from me so they know when a child abuse case hits their floor, uh, they know how to access this web page and the child protection uh, guidelines. So how do we diagnose abuse? First and foremost, suspicion is the first thing. And in order to have a suspicion, we should have a baseline knowledge of uh, physical abuse. Then knowing what to do to recognize uh, physical abuse, and finally arriving uh, at a diagnostic uh, decision. In terms of developing a suspicion, knowing, oops, oh, I, I don't know if you guys are seeing uh, the risk factors boxes, but they're lost, unfortunately. So there are, perhaps you're seeing it and I am not, uh, so there are child-related risk factors, parent-related risk factors, 
and uh, community and society related risk factors. And I'd be more than happy to send the slide to Shauna so she can uh, send it uh, to everybody. So uh, another thing I would like you to remember after this uh, presentation is uh, to remember this triangle, which I came to call oral triangle. Uh, this is what we actually do in medicine with every single case. We obtain a history of trauma. Uh, we look at the child's age, the developmental level, etc. And we also look at the child's injury, illness, mechanism, and extent of that. And we put these three pieces together, and if they all fit, and we can establish this concrete triangle, then it is fine. That means we have the diagnosis. But if we lose one side of this triangle, uh, then uh, that means something is not matching. And that is the point when we should have a suspicion for physical abuse, and we should look at the case a little bit more deeply. And when we look at these uh, cases with concern for child abuse and neglect, uh, especially the younger the child, uh, the more detailed birth history, history of hospitalizations, any illnesses, emergency room visits, et cetera, information about those will be much more relevant and uh, necessary. When we gather all this information, then we should identify when the child was last seen normal with the date and time of that status. And then from that point on, what kind of caretakers were involved in the care of the child, whether there were any triggers for abuse or not, what kind of events took place in a sequential uh, manner, uh, and finally, we get to when was the uh, first ominous symptom of not being normal observed, and from that point on, what kind of inter interventions uh, took place. We should gather all these uh, pieces of information in great detail. Uh, other indicators of, of physical abuse uh, would include uh, certain behavioral changes. Any extremes of behaviors listed on this slide, if the child is you know, walking healthy and healthy looking at least, and comes to Barnehus on an outpatient basis, these behaviors should not be taken lightly because they may have a meaning behind it. Your psychosocial history may reveal more to make sense of such uh, behaviors that may be observed with a child. Uh, and um, obviously, these may be even more specific uh, behavioral uh, issues that we should pay attention to when we are considering uh, child physical abuse. Then observations related to child-parent interaction or um, child relating to the caretaker, these may be very important uh, as well. Uh, physically abusive parents may bring their child to the hospital to get the injuries treated, but they may also be angry with the child that they find themselves in the emergency room setting or in the uh, Barnehus setting. Or they may be defensive or aggressive, uh, especially when you start feeling like the caretaker is trying to cover up something that should raise significant concern uh, for physical abuse. Then we have the physical indicators of physical abuse that would raise concern uh, for something not going right. For instance, if we observe bruises, welts, burns, and any uh, unexpected mark on the child's body, that should be concerning. Unexplained fractures or incidentally discovered fractures. A child comes in with bronchiolitis, 
and you do a chest X-ray, and on the chest X-ray, you see several rib fractures. Those are very concerning. Obviously, brain injuries, subdural hematoma, bleeding in the eye grounds, etc. And these children would be uh, inpatient children, obviously, as well as the children with internal organ injuries. We should always keep in one side of our mind whether these might be inflicted, uh, not accidental. And a lot of times, physically abusive individuals wait for the injuries to heal only when the injuries and the complications get so bad they bring their child to the ER. This delay in seeking medical help should be very concerning as well. Then certain patterns of injuries uh, give us the ability to recognize abuse. If the description of the injury, its type, severity, age, mechanism, etc., are not consistent with the history of trauma, remember the Oral's triangle, uh, and or the child's developmental level, that should raise a very significant red flag. Injuries typical for inflicted injury, and I'm going to show you just a few slides uh, toward that regard. Uh, injuries with no history of trauma. I fed the baby, put him in the crib, and in two hours I came uh, to check on him. He wasn't breathing, and the child has a bleeding in the brain, bleeding in the eyes, and in coma. Pattern injuries that indicate the use of an object and multiple injuries at various stages of healing may be extremely concerning. So this slide, uh, for those of you who are not medical providers, may not mean anything to you. But for the medical providers, uh, I have to show you that I don't know if you're seeing my moving arrow, but the four arrows on the four side show healed uh, or healing rib fractures, as well as the six arrows uh, on the left side. Uh, in addition, this child has uh, two on the right side and three on the left side healed old rib fractures. And a good radiologist would also catch the very severe healing arm fracture on the right uh, shoulder. So uh, even if this kind of a child has multiple accidental trauma history, uh, I would be extremely concerned for physical abuse on this child and definitely report this child uh, to uh, Child Protective uh, Services. And these two are referring to uh, newer uh, rib fractures, acute rib fractures. And uh, the ch this child uh, has uh, a very severe posterior rib fracture uh, and another one on the left side as well. So, hmm, oh my goodness. This slide is totally missing my beautiful pictures. OK. Well, uh, I know from my presentation that um, this slide uh, was supposed to have shown metaphyseal fractures, which are corner fractures at the end of uh, joints. Uh, and um, so these are very specific uh, for child abuse and neglect. And uh, with rib fractures, one of the uh, most um, significant and specific abusive uh, fractures. OK. So in order to identify all of these, uh, our diagnostic workup will include what we call a skeletal survey. And skeletal survey means the arms, the hands, the legs, the feet, the chest, uh, the, uh, the pelvis, uh, the spine, the head, the neck. All of these structures are going to be x-rayed on uh, dedicated uh, x-rays so that we can see 
all the details of a possible fracture site. And if we are concerned uh, of skeletal injuries in a physical abuse case, repeat skeletal survey, especially in children under one year of age, is highly recommended and your medical providers uh, should know this. Uh-oh. I am so sorry. I don't know what's going on. All my images are gone, ladies. Uh, so this was uh, showing the skeletal survey uh, images consisting of um, about uh, 16 uh, images, at least 16 images. Okay, there's a question here. I think we're going to take the questions at the end, right? Uh-oh. Um, uh, Shauna, is it possible to send uh, the handout to everybody so they can open the images? Um, because this is not going to work because all the images are missing. And I'm going to open my own presentation on my uh, computer here in a second because I have memorized some of the images even when the images are not there, but not all of them. Okay. All right. Where are we? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so yes, um, the slide that we're not seeing right now, which is slide 30, when you get um, the handout, um, um, uh, is showing two x-rays that are not uh, appropriate uh, images. One is a skull x-ray with multiple probes on the skull. And as a result, if there are any skull fractures on this image, we wouldn't be able to see anything whatsoever. And then the other one is a chest x-ray with a, a side marker, right side lead marker, covering the entire right chest and no refractors on this x-ray. Uh, on the right side would be appreciated, unfortunately. So I am moving. OK. So the text slides are showing fine, but the image slides are not showing, it looks like. So the next slide, slide 31, uh, walks us through the diagnostic workup uh, in acute head trauma which obviously should be admitted as an inpatient to the hospital. And that's why your Barnehus must be working with your uh, hospital. Head CT is uh, done during the acute phase. And head MRI is done in subacute and uh, chronic phases. OK, again, our images are missing. Uh, under the CT images, there would be four CT images showing acute subdural hematomas on the top two images and severe brain edema on the uh, lower uh, two images. And brain edema means brain swelling. And uh, the left-sided images are also showing uh, bleed, various kinds of bleeding uh, in the brain. And the lowermost three images, which are called 3D images, are showing the skull fractures, uh, depressed and linear uh, skull fractures. So am I just moving on? And then the next slide. Uh, which is slide 33. 
Okay, Katerina, you have control of the screen, I understand. So slide 31 uh, shows us MR, ma magnetic resonance imaging, MRI images uh, of the uh, brain uh, injury specifically. Uh, and these are, again, bleeding in the brain, uh, swelling of the brain, infarction of the brain, a variety of injuries uh, that uh, your physicians and your radiologists would um, evaluate uh, together. So I'm moving on. On slide 34, which is a um, uh, text message again, I don't know if you're seeing it or not. Uh, there is a, uh, OK. Is it OK if I move on? Because I'm not seeing anything on the shared screen right now. I'm just moving on with my own uh, slide presentation. So the diagnostic workup in severely injured comatose children and those with clear abdominal or chest injuries should have chest and abdomen CT as well. And in addition, a variety of uh, blood uh, tests will need to be done, which will be important for um, uh, your physician. And moving on, I am now on slide 36. Uh, urine tests, uh, hair tests for drug toxicology is routine in the United States, as well as and organ tests, including the liver, the kidney, the pancreas, uh, must be done uh, as well in severe uh, injury cases. And especially in abusive head trauma cases, we also do metabolic and genetic uh, tests. Uh, in addition to ophthalmology consultation in abuse of head trauma cases uh, to see whether there's bleeding in the eye grounds or not. I am moving on. Uh, and finally, in terms of diagnostic workup, uh, genetics consultation uh, is done to rule out uh, genetic conditions. Uh, and uh, in severe neglect cases, which may need to be admitted to the hospital also, uh, there's a number of additional tests uh, that need to be done. Especially severely neglected children uh, usually uh, have developmental delays as well, and that needs to be uh, worked up too. Uh, and finally, in failure to thrive cases, nutritional assessment should be done. So, uh, okay, it looks like it's in my hands again. Oh, okay, so some images came up. These are the skull fracture images, if you're able to see them. Okay, MR images are not seen. We went through this already. And we went through this slide already. And this is the uh, retinal bleeding image. Uh, OK. So what makes us suspicious? If there are too many, too big injuries in too young infants, bruises in protected areas of the body, which I'm going to show you, Pattern bruises indicating the use of an object. Black eyes without uh, appropriate history. Bite marks and bruises of various stages of healing on body sites with similar structures would be very uh, concerning. Um, a very wise team of researchers developed this 10-4 acronym. 10 stands for T for the torso, the chest, E for the ears, N for the neck, and 4 is a child under 4 years of age, and 
any bruise on a child less than four months of age, okay? So if you see any of these injuries, and including the injury on the neck that is shown on the slide, we should be concerned for physical abuse right there and then. And uh, oh, this also, <laughs> uh, again, these green highlights would have been on the child's body on the left, and the red highlights would have been, again, on the child's uh, body where the uh, gray areas are, if you're able to uh, see them. So uh, basically, uh, the suspicious bruises are on the trunk, front and back, including the abdomen, the chest, the buttocks, and uh, on the backs of the thighs and the legs, uh, and on the front thighs, and um, on, the, uh, on the cheek, uh, on the bruises, uh, on the uh, bridge of the nose, uh, and the internal aspects of the uh, arms and shoulders, these would be without appropriate uh, history of trauma concerning for uh, physical abuse. Uh, and then we mentioned that uh, devices to use for documentation is very important. Here is uh, a high-end camera that I use to document injuries. And when I document an injury, I not only use a right-angle ruler, but also uh, a topography uh, identifier so that when all is said and done, I'm not going to say, oh my gosh, where was this injury on the child's body? Okay, so this is the metaphyseal corner fracture that I mentioned earlier and you didn't see the images. Notice that there is the bone, uh, which is fine, but then there is this gray area, which is bone healing, which we call periosteal reaction. And then these fluffy gray-white areas, which we call bucket handle or corner, are fractures at the metaphyseal junction of this joint. Very specific for abuse, as well as rib fractures. New rib fractures and healing rib fractures that we see here are also very specific uh, for physical abuse. And the mechanism for these fractures is usually an angry caretaker holding the child, facing one another, and squeezing the child's chest cavity uh, a lot of times in an, um, in an incident of uh, shaking. Vertebral fractures, the fractures of the spine, uh, especially the posterior uh, fractures, are uh, very specific but relatively rare uh, abusive fractures. Scapular fractures, uh, shoulder blade fractures, are also very specific, as well as, uh, oops, we missed the sternal fracture. Sternal fracture is the chest bone fracture. These are also very specific when observed, but they are not uh, very commonly uh, seen. And whenever we see any of these injuries, we must uh, look into whether we're able to establish this triangle or we're losing at least one side. Then we must start thinking of filing a report with Child Protection Services. A couple of examples about how the uh, trauma history may fit or not fit what we observe. This child standing on the couch, if this is the history of trauma provided to me, may indeed fall off this couch, okay? I would expect, because the kid is less than one year of age, uh, you know, uh, looking at the appearance, some adult would be in very close vicinity of the child so that, you know, they can jump in and protect the child from falling. So we may consider supervision neglect if this child indeed falls 
off the couch uh, and get some injury. But this kind of a fall, especially falling onto a carpeted surface, should not lead to coma because there isn't enough acceleration and angular velocity to cause significant brain injury. It may cause this kind of a fracture if the child lands on the bent knee, for instance, uh, a bruise or two, but any, even a skull fracture, if it's a hardwood floor, for instance, uh, onto which the child may fall from a standing position, but nothing else. If this child has um, metaphyseal fractures, when you do a skeletal survey, corner fractures, as we mentioned before, unexplained healing or healed extremity fracture, or a depressed skull fracture, or bleeding in the brain, then we must start thinking of uh, physical abuse. This child playing on the top bunk bed, uh, especially if they're playing here alone, with no supervision, this kiddo over here on the left seems to be uh, younger. Uh, that would definitely be supervision neglect in uh, the US laws at least. But even this kind of a fall would unlikely uh, be uh, able to lead to coma because of, again, not enough acceleration and angular velocity. But especially if this is hardwood floor, the kid may easily get skull fracture, subgallial hematoma, which is bleeding in the scalp, and subdural hematoma, but we would expect that to be focal. Anything, anything addition to these uh, should raise uh, concern for uh, physical abuse. This, for instance, uh, image shows uh, subgallial hematoma bleeding in the scalp a skull fracture, and underneath that, a subdural, focal subdural hematoma. This kid may still be smiling, eating, drinking, everything fine and dandy. This injury, this constellation of injury, may be consistent with falling off a top, uh, top bunk bed, especially onto a hardwood floor. But if this kid is, um, and this may be the focal subdural hematoma, but if this kid uh, has this kind of diastetic widened skull fracture as a result of severe brain edema and being in coma because of this fall, or there is this type of big black brain which shows very severe brain swelling and subdural hematomas and multiple uh, injuries on the scalp uh, et cetera, uh, as well as on skeletal survey, again, uh, a metaphyseal corner fracture, uh, and especially retinal bleeding as shown here, then forget about it. Uh, this is uh, a physical abuse case, not a simple fall uh, off the top bunk bed. So post-consultation post procedures are extremely important too because in these severe cases, first of all, not only multiple disciplines will have to provide input, but also community agency staff, so, uh, child protection services, police officers, even the prosecutors will need to be involved in the discussions uh, so that we can hold a multidisciplinary interagency collaborative team meeting like this. Medical providers share the medical information. Uh, child protection shares the psychosocial uh, issues related to the family. Police provides the uh, investigative knowledge. So as a result, we collaboratively make a decision on what needs to happen with this family. To sum up, Child abuse and neglect requires a high index of suspicion, focusing on behavioral uh, and physical indicators of abuse and the psychosocial history and the medical history we will obtain uh, from the family and from the community agency representatives. In our diagnostic workup, uh, collaborating with a hospital is extremely important so that 
skeletal survey, head CT, abdominal, chest CT, and uh, MR, and other x-rays that are uh, helpful imaging tools can be conducted in the hospital setting uh, with the input from a team that works very collaboratively and closely with the Barnehus team. And um, other tests that may be needed for the workup uh, to diagnose uh, physical abuse and to rule out differential diagnostic entities must also be available through that hospital setting. One last thing that I want to add here is in the United States, a lot of Barnehus uh, facilities are established within a hospital. As a result, Barnehus team, especially the medical team of the Barnehus, in fact becomes the inpatient consultant. team for physical abuse and acute sexual assault cases as well. In fact, that kind of a model is the most cost-effective uh, model uh, that eliminates miscommunications, lack of communication, uh, and cases falling through the cracks. I think this was my last slide. I apologize for um, the technical difficulty which Katerina resolved. And I will stop here. And Thanks so much, Rosia. Yeah, I, I also apologize. I, I think that uh, sometimes Adobe, uh, this, this software has a hard time with, with images, especially when they're um, like animated. There's an animation attached to them. So lessons learned for moving forward. No more animations. <laughs> I think that could be it. Anyway. Um, I think Stefan is trying to come back uh, online with us as well. Before I um, get to the two questions that we've had, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions in the chat. There's still some time. Maybe we'll have some time to get to what you, what you want. And if not, we can email you later. Uh, so Ruth um, asked a question earlier about a, a working example experienced in her past position where she wasn't sure how to act. She was working in a medical center for undocumented migrants where they were concerned for the welfare of two young children uh, because of neglect, poor hygiene, uh, physically small for their age. The mother allowed the doctor to examine her two older children who were, they were specifically concerned about, um, but the mother refused that the doctor examine the two younger children. They wanted to make sure all the children under her care were in good health. As we did not have suspicions around their particular well-being, it was difficult to insist that the mother allow the examination. Mm, what would you have done in this situation? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think I would. Uh, have uh, found a culturally uh, competent, same language uh, person to communicate with the mother to understand what her concerns were about the examination of the uh, younger two children. Um, I mean, sometimes people uh, who have concerns about the injuries on a child's body if they know that the system will uh, get involved, may refuse physical examination. But there may also be some reasons that we don't understand that has something to do with their culture. And when we understand their concerns, if it is something that we can uh, eliminate, the concern I mean, uh, we may explain the situation uh, to calm them down, to get permission from them. Uh, and sometimes it may be an educational opportunity. Uh, whatever concern they have, maybe some kind of a superstition and this and that. Again, with the help of somebody that understands their culture, preferably 
that is from their culture, we may help educate that person. Uh, that's a possibility. And sometimes elderly people may control the culture in families coming from certain cultures, and engaging them in the conversation may help as well. It may be that a mother-in-law at home might have said, don't you ever have anybody touch these two babies? Uh, and then she might be following her instruction, and we Thank may you have so more much. control uh, over that. Sure, I have asked if you have been uh, mistaken about a diagnosis, and uh, what was the background? Or vice versa, I suppose, yes. Oh, uh, you mean diagnosing physical abuse when it was not physical abuse? Or, okay, let me share with you a very good example. Uh, when I was a junior faculty here in my first year, a child came to us um, about nine, ten months old uh, with a very big subgallial hematoma. And subgallial hematoma is bleeding in the scalp, which gives a copper-like color to the forehead and upper portion of the cheeks and the entire head. Uh, but the child didn't have anything else. It was just that subgallial hematoma. No bleeding in the brain, no skull fracture. And the history of trauma was the child was sitting on the father's lap and made a jerking backwards movement. And the father lost grip of the child, and the child fell backward had an impact on the head, uh, but had only the subgallial hematoma, nothing else. And when I was examining the child, the child did that exact same jerking movement backwards. I caught the child, otherwise he was going to hit his head against the metal railing of the crib he was in. So having observed what the father was telling me, I said, OK, I have the triangle. Right? The oral triangle is there. History of trauma, uh, child's developmental level, and extent of the injury all fit together. And I said, there's no reason to file a report to DHS on this case. This is an unforeseen accident. And then uh, two days later, I got a call from DHS, uh, Department of Human Services here, and DHS said, they got a call from a neighbor, and the neighbor said, this was a drug home. The parents were doing drugs, and the kids were on their own, and they were very concerned for the well-being of the children. OK? So that taught me I was concerned about the size of the subgallial hematoma. It was huge, but then the guy's, the guy's example made sense, too, but the child was very young, under one year of age. I still should have filed a report with DHS. And I felt so happy that somebody oh, from fantastic. the community. Fantastic. Thank you. You know, I just got word that actually, so Stefan hasn't gotten his video back, but he is still with us via voice. Stefan. Uh, perhaps I give you the last word. What reflections do you have on today's presentation, and do you have anything to add to the questions that were just asked? Uh, so thank you. I, I hope you can hear me. I've, I've, I've lost contact, unfortunately, via video. But uh, thank you, Resmia, for a, a very good talk and, and uh, structuring uh, the points about physical abuse really well. I, I, I just want to comment really on the last uh, uh, that you talked about the child that you sort of saw or doing the things that it did and you it made sense to you. I think it's very good you talked about having a protocol for all children that come with injuries at the hospital and just follow the protocol and just do as you always do with every injury that this is a protocol. We make a report to social services because it's this kind of injury. We don't think so much maybe how, how the injury is, is sort of obtained. It's just an injury that could be caused by. And we do it with routine and follow a protocol. And usually uh, that, that sort of um, makes uh, sense also to and getting a better sort of 
this is how good we are. This is what we do because we have the protocol. We follow that, and and that sort of makes it easier to pick up these children, if even if it's uh, someone who doesn't really work with this kind of uh, children um, always. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks so much. We we have one more question about um, Thank you. Uh, triggering the child when uh, I guess in the evaluation phase. Uh, re re traumatizing the child during the the uh, eva the medical evaluation. Sorry, I didn't get. Yeah, that's a very good question, too. Well, in the US, we have a support system that is called Child Life Specialist. So in every uh, inpatient unit, um, there are Child Life Specialists, especially when there is a difficult procedure, blood drawing, or the kind of examinations that we do we invite the child life specialist to join us to engage the child and also we medical providers take our time for instance when i go into a room after having met with the family having taken the history i approach the child right away and most of the physically abused children are young infants uh, I put my uh, hand on their heads and rub their cheek a little bit. If they're very, very young, put my finger in their palms and they grab it right away and try to connect and, you know, uh, talk with them in a very nice, mellow voice uh, and make it uh, as uh, problem-free uh, as possible and child life and the nurse are also great support uh, in uh, doing that. In older children, I explain to the child in great detail what I'm going to do. I make sure they understand nothing is going to hurt in my examination. I'm just going to touch you. I hold their hand just like this. Does this hurt? No, it doesn't. And this is how I'm going to do. I'm going to touch your arm, your hands, your leg. I'll look at your face and your head. I'll listen to you. Explain everything in great detail, showing all the devices and making sure I repeat time and time again, there's no needle, no shot, no hurting. And if you feel uncomfortable when I examine you, tell me I will stop right away. And I do. I give them time, and then they calm down, and then we try one more time. And with this, to tell you the truth, I haven't had any child that refused the examination or scream bloody murder. Uh, it goes uh, perfectly fine. Perhaps in resource-limited countries, especially educating your nurses, to become your That's absolutely client brilliant. Client Thanks so client. much, and thank you for the question. Uh, it is an important consideration, of course, in these sensitive situations. I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. I would like to thank Stefan for his contributions at the end, and for he agreed with you completely, Resmia, with what you just said uh, in terms of the, the experience there. And of course, Resmia Oral from the US, thank you so much for not only uh, giving your consistent and, uh, and enthusiastic support in Promise 1, but continuing to stick with us in the second phase. And uh, you, you're always a, a brilliant, shining face and, and, a, and a, warm, a warm person to speak to. So thank you for being with us. Yes? Yes. May I say something? Uh, my friends, um, obviously, uh, what we're doing here is just a tiny little introduction to medical piece in child abuse evaluation. I do a lot of international training uh, and uh, systems building work. If anybody would like to uh, work with me, 
I come to Greece every year uh, and Turkey every year as well. I would be more than happy to do a side trip to any country uh, that is represented uh, here. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, with Mia. And again, thank you, everyone. I turn it over to Child Hub team for a final thank word. You. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, and I really don't want to keep uh, any of you. I just want to thank to the whole team for this wonderful webinar. And as Razmia just said, um, the more we are getting into this topic, the more questions arise. Um, because we, and I really appreciate the fact that we can get into the details. And I would like to encourage our listeners to join us for the next uh, webinar. Um, and if Shana, if you could put that back uh, on the slide, maybe the, the time of the next webinar. Yes, the 19th. So that's the the third and last part of this uh, mini series. So we hope uh, you will join us. And thank you very much for all for being with us and for the wonderful discussions. Bye bye. Ciao.